Hey, weirdos. I'm Elena. I'm Ash. And this is Morbid. about that hey i know i was maybe it's the eyeshadow of it all it's the eyeshadow you look great you've never <laughs> looked better one of my daughters <laughs> while we were getting them ready for dance decided to give me a makeover yeah while you're waiting you know might as well and she grabbed a halloween palette <laughs> yep a halloween palette Aww. that i have and i actually kept that palette haven't used it because I wanted to wait for Halloween, mm. and I figured they could use that palette, because I'm sure they're going to want to be something fun and fancy and, you know, all that fun stuff. But boy, did so they use there it. there is pumpkin orange glitter, and glitter glitter in this palette. Like drag queen glitter. Like so glitter. So glitter. Yeah. And <laughs> so glitter. <laughs> and she said, Mom, close your eyes. And I said, okay. And she... She did it. She lipsticked you too, but that she went away. She lipsticked me too, but that went away. But the eyeshadow remains and might remain until the day I die because <laughs> it's really, it's really <laughs> embedded in there. But I feel uh, spooky, ooky. And you look great. You know what? She gave me a gift. <laughs> she gave you her all. <laughs> she did. They I were like, it. what did they say? <laughs> Oh, the other one wanted to do mine. And I was like, I already have makeup on. And Elena goes, you can never have too much. <laughs> and I was like, nope, you can. Less is more. Bye. Have fun at dance. So here I am. I here got I out. am sitting with with my fancy eyeballs, yeah, okay? I got out I'm sorry stage. that you feel inadequate now. I, I don't. I, I don't. I feel safe over here. You marked. feel safe because of this disco ball. You know, on here. Facebook when people are like, I've been marked safe from like this <laughs> You're horrible marked thing. safe from glitter. I was. It was I. It was I. You know what I wasn't marked safe from? My, the bottom of my hair is so crusty. <laughs> wow. Okay. Like dry. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's so funny over there <laughs> glitter head that made it sound weird the Crust, fact that you crusty? had to like you, like clarify what you meant you were like you, like dry dry like not just crusty no, like, <laughs> like these crusty crusts i got <laughs> on the bottom of my hair for glazelle it was her lips for me it's my ends <laughs> there you go <laughs> that, that speaks to someone i'm sorry so. about that but summer's almost over everybody so don't worry about it yay because spooky season is coming is upon us mm, it's here as far as i'm concerned yeah and i have a hair appointment tomorrow so party Oh my god! For this, I, I saw. I, I was saw. really trying to connect that. You're like, what does that have to do with spooky season? But it started with hair. I was still on my hair. I see. It's I called see. being self centered. <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> um, so I guess there's no better way to go into no a case than that. <laughs> yeah, what better way? Um, this I have like a bummer one today. Obviously, um. And it's it's interesting. I was reading like articles to try to find my next couple of cases and I saw a book pop up and I was like, whoa, that looks interesting. And that's how I discovered the Rainbow Family. I don't think I've ever heard of this one. Nor had I. Yeah. So it all starts with a girl named Nancy. Okay. And from a very early age, Nancy Santomero knew whatever she ended up doing for her career, she wanted it to be something that helped people. And I think that automatically is just really fucking sweet yeah her mother Jean told reporters in 2000 she had such promise such a free spirit she wanted to be a forest ranger oh. it was the end of the 1970s and she was non-materialistic she just wanted to improve society oh nancy it was almost like nancy was born a couple years too late Mm. In the late 70s, her love of nature and, you know, her deep feelings of empathy and compassion for others reminded most people of the hippie subculture that had recently uh, kind of been yeah. left behind. Now, most people were going on to a period that was, you know, maybe a bit more self-centered and definitely a whole lot more materialistic. But Nancy's family always encouraged her interests and respected the kind of hippie-esque culture that she felt so close to. That's a good family. It is. They just supported her and loved yeah. her for who she was. And she had a lot to offer. Her mother later said, I didn't even worry when she was hitchhiking. 
because her family and her mother included knew she had a close knit group of girl friends and just friends in general who could very much hold their own in a potential conflict. I love that she was like, I wasn't worried. Like, they're boss bitches. I'm not worried about them at all. No, she's like, they got this. Now, one of those girls was 26-year-old Vicky Durian. Vicky was known to her friends as Bright Star. Stop it. Um, Like, immediately, I was like, I love Vicky. I was just going to say, this is like, I just want to be around these people. Right? And so, Vicky being also known as Bright Star, you can see why she and Nancy hit it off immediately. They both had very free spirits. They were open people, friendly people. Vicky was born and raised in actually a very rural area, Wellman, Iowa. It was a town where there were only about a thousand people. Whoa. Yeah. But like Nancy, Vicky had a strong sense of empathy and compassion. She really liked helping people. What a duo. I know. After high school, she became a licensed practical nurse. So she was also like, like a multifaceted chica there. Oh, yeah. And it seemed like a natural fit for somebody with her skills and personality. Now, even though she had a well-established career and she was very much professionally trained, Vicky still identified, it seemed, even more so as like a free-spirited person who wanted to get out and experience the world. Yes. I love it. It starts off so beautifully. Now, Vicky and Nancy's friend, Liz Jondrow, told reporters, Bright Star was a loving person. She was real open to everybody, even if they weren't like her. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that's like the kind that's of people... That's how everybody should be. Yeah, that's the kind of people you want to surround yourself with. Yeah, just be open to people. Yeah. So Liz actually had met Vicky outside of a food co-op in Tucson in the late 70s, and the two of them became really fast friends because Vicky let then-teenage Liz stay at her apartment when she had nowhere oh. else to go. Now, it was through Vicky that Liz eventually met Nancy, and then the three girls bonded together over their increasingly uncommon interest of the hippie lifestyle which is crazy that like even though even like at the end of the 70s it was pretty much done yeah like that it it changed over so quick yeah it seems like it was just all of a sudden like oh nope that's not okay yeah like we're on to new things on to material items but now um, look the hippie like you know look at least yeah like aesthetic is still it's constantly in style i feel like in some ways Yeah, and I think there's, like, a lot more music festivals now that kind of try to, like, borrow from Mm -hmm. the ones back in the day. Yeah. But, yeah, so they were were a couple of hippies, and they loved hitchhiking. Okay. It was just a good way to get around. Now, as we all know, it was obviously wildly popular in the 70s to hitchhike Mm -hmm. in the the early 70s. But by the end of the decade, most of the general public kind of realized how dangerous it could be, like, accepting a ride from a stranger. That's so sad. Which... I think the the reason a lot of people started to realize it is because the news and the press started covering more serial killers and more instances of violent crimes from hitchhiking. Yeah, you're never hearing about like like I'm a like I would never hitchhike just because I'm scared of everybody. But well, now it's <laughs> so I was like, different. Now it's so different. But like you also back then were not hearing about the millions of successful hitchhiking that happened every single day. Where somebody was brought to the place they were looking to go and had a nice conversation and met somebody kind and great and was better for the experience. Like you didn't hear about any of that. You only, it's like a plane crash. Exactly. You only hear about the bad ones. You're not hearing about the thousands that take off a day that successfully get where they need to go. Precisely. Look at you. Just, you know, you get it. Yeah. The girls that get it, get it. That's me. No, but listen, even with that awareness, there were still people who felt like the benefits, like we were just saying, outweighed the risks and they were comfortable taking rides from Mm -hmm. strangers. Liz would later tell reporters, hitchhiking is a cheap, easy, free way to travel. We could get off anywhere we wanted. No worries about gas or cars. You meet people who are just interested in hearing about your travels. We were no strings attached people. And wouldn't it be nice if that's all it was? That'd be great. You just meet people, get a little different perspective on stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Hear about their fun trip they're taking and then be like, bye. And like you said, like Have maybe even time. leave better for it. You yeah. Know? Like, oh, what a cool guy. Wouldn't that be what a nice cool gal. if that was just the way it was and we could be that way as a species. It would be so sick. It would be. But we're one of the most terrifying species yeah, ever. Sure are. So in June of 1980, Vicki traveled from Wisconsin where she had recently moved for work to her family home in Wellman because she was attending her brother's graduation. And Nancy planned to meet Vicky at Vicky's parents' house in Iowa after the grad party was over. Okay. And together with Liz, the three of them were going to hitchhike their way to the Rainbow Family's 4th of July celebration in Marlinton, West Virginia, otherwise known as 
a rainbow gathering. This sounds adorable. Oh, it's it's just so pure. Like okay. I could see myself wanting to go to this when I, if I like lived oh, back then. You would have been all over this. 100%. Now the Rainbow Family was started in 1971. It's like very interesting reading about it because you're like who exactly started this? Like <laughs> what there's, happened? <laughs> there's a couple people that started it, but they're like we're pretty informally led. Oh. So It was started by an informally connected group of mostly young people with pretty progressive ideals. And they're known for organizing really large gatherings that are just supposed to celebrate the spirit of the counterculture movement from the 70s. Oh, that's fun. Hippies. Yeah. They don't really have any specific agenda. There's not really any organizing principles. They're mostly understood by the public as a well-intended group who, quote, are out to seek a little earnest spiritual fulfillment, learn a thing or two, and have a good time in the process. That seems wonderful. Like, who the fuck doesn't want to go to that? Yeah. Now, their annual gatherings were pretty free form. They included events and activities that drew from spirituality, like New Age spirituality and the back to nature movement. And they also uh, incorporated cultural elements of the 1960s, like music and sexual freedom. Oh, lots of stuff going on. It's fucking awesome. Yeah. It's like very Woodstock, it sounds like. Yeah. You know? No, we as, loved it. <laughs> we loved it. As the Washington Post described it, it was as, as if the rainbow people had slipped through a time warp, a slice of the 60s suddenly wedged into the 80s. Huh, that's which, interesting. Like, Sign me up. Yeah. Let's do the time warp again. Yeah. I mean, I'll watch from far away. But yeah. I'll, I'll make sure you have like popcorn. I'll support stuff. you. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll write you a postcard from there. Cool. Now, while the attendees of the rainbow family gatherings may have been mostly well intended, it seems. Their annual convergence on very, very rural locations had a tendency to worry local law enforcement over what they referred to as, quote, the high potential for user conflict. Essentially, they were worried about the largely progressive counterculture attendees coming up against the largely conservative locals. Eek. Who really resented public nudity, the like flagrant drug use, and what they felt was a general disregard for authority. Okay. Just no. two different sides of a coin coming together. It's very opposite ends of the yeah. spectrum here. Luckily, the troublemakers seemed to be pretty few and far between, and most attendees overall were like Vicky, Nancy, and Liz. Yeah. Just free-spirited people trying to keep up the ideals of hippie culture alive in a very different world. Mm-hmm. But still, in the weeks before this gathering was set to begin in Marlinton, West Virginia, the Secretary of State, James Manchin, um, excuse me, A. James Manchin, actually filed a suit to against the group in an attempt to stop this gathering from Damn. happening altogether. He told reporters, West Virginia didn't need this bunch of derelict misfits. I mean, that was a choice, having it in West Virginia. I will say that. It was, it was a choice. I'm not saying it was a bad choice. I'm not saying it was a good choice. It was just a choice. It's simply a choice. It was an like, interesting choice. Derelict misfits? I mean, I think yeah. they're just trying to vibe. That's what I think. It sounds like they're not doing anything. Like, let them hang. Let them vibe. Let them hang. Let them just do their thing. Yeah. It'll it'll end. And then they go home. And then that's it. Who cares? Now, his suit was unsuccessful at keeping the Rainbow family from coming to West Virginia. I figured. But that specific instance definitely highlights the tensions that were building over before the event had even begun. You can see that it was clearly like an issue. And and people in town were not excited about it. In a big issue. This isn't like a bunch of people just being like, oh, this is annoying. It's like the Secretary of State is trying to sue them. (laughs) That's a lot. That's pretty big. Now, when Liz, Nancy, and Vicky left from the Durian's house on June 20th, their plan was to hitchhike to the gathering, which was going to be held in, I looked this up, so I'm going to do my best, West Virginia's Monongahela National Forest. Wow. Yeah. Impressive. Very cool. You're talking about my pronunciation, right? Thank you. Very impressive. So that was the plan. They were going to hitchhike there. And then when they got there, they were going to meet up with Nancy's sister, Kathy, who was also going to be going to the festival. Okay. Kathy's plan was to drive herself down a few days later. Okay. However, their plan changed just a few days later when they reached Richmond, Virginia on the 24th of June. The day before, the three friends were picked up in South Carolina by the driver of a commercial bus. And Liz later told reporters, it was raining. And as I stared out the window, something told me not to go to the rainbow gathering. Ooh, 
She just had like a premonition. Oh, always listen to your gut, man. And she did. So many times I have not listened to my gut and I regret it every time. Yeah, she said it was just something yeah. like telling her not to go. Wow. So instead, she placed a call to her father in Connecticut and she arranged for transportation wow. to get back home. She really listened. Mm -hmm. She's a spiritual girl. Yeah. Of course she did. And actually, her dad was going to be getting married the next weekend. So going home seemed like the right thing to do anyways, even yeah. despite her feeling. Seems and like there was a lot of convergence of signs there that she was like, you know what? Yeah, that's the thing. And I yeah. wonder if she just kind of like kept the feeling to herself and was like, it's about me, like not yeah. about them kind of mm -hmm. thing. So they, the three of them made plans to get together in Vermont later that summer. And okay. they, were, they totally understood that yeah. Liz didn't want to go anymore. And the last thing Vicky and Nancy said to Liz was, be careful. And then oh, they proceeded God. on their way to West Virginia to the Rainbow Gathering. Oh, boy. Now, around 9 p.m. on June 25th, so just one day after Vicky and Nancy parted ways with Liz, a student walking back to his lean-to in Briary Knob near Droop Mountain Park discovered two bodies lying face down in the woods, both dead from apparent gunshot wounds. Oh. Now... They were nearly 40 miles from the Rainbow family gathering, but police immediately believed that these two women had attended the gathering due to one of them wearing a shirt with a rainbow motif, motif similar to emblems used by participants of the gathering. Okay. Now, other than that, neither woman had any identification or other clues about their identities. Ugh. So the news of the two mur murders, excuse me, came as a shock to some but not all attendees at the Rainbow Family Gathering. Hmm. One of the organizers of the gathering, Tony Crow, told reporters about an unrelated instance. He said, quote, There were 11 shots fired into the site. It looks oh, like some of the locals have gone a little gun crazy. Oh. So basically people were targeting this event. Wow. And like the site where the gathering was actually taking place, that's what had happened. People shot Jeez. into it. Now, but like I said, unrelated instance. Or incident, excuse me. That's scary. But despite the deaths, the event continued without a second thought. One attendee told reporters, It's a really bad thing that it should happen, but I know that those two sisters who have passed on to another realm would be very unhappy if they saw that it affected the energy of this gathering. No comment. I'm just going to stay here. I don't know how they would feel. I have no idea. I uh, Yeah. We'll leave it at that. Yeah. But since the deaths did not affect the gathering, the identities of the victims were still unknown. And Nancy's sister, Kathy, had no reason to change her plans. So at the end of the, uh, excuse me, at the end of June, she and some friends traveled to West Virginia to meet up with her sister. Oh. Mm -hmm. Years later, Kathy told reporters, when I arrived, no one knew where Nancy was. That week, I heard two girls were killed in the country, but there were no photos. I was a little worried, but someone said the victims were American Indians. Now, when Kathy still hadn't been able to locate her sister after several days, she just figured that Nancy had found something that interested her more, so she left the area. Ugh. She said that would have been pretty typical of her. Because, again, like, very free-spirited people. I was going to say, that's you know? the thing. And she, I mean, this is, like, in your wildest nightmares, you couldn't imagine that this happened to your sister. No, of course not. And nothing in your brain wants you, wants to believe Exactly. So it's going to tell you no way. Mm -hmm. There's no way. Right. So Kathy and her friends drove back to New York on July 5th. But when she got home, some friends had received a copy of the Pocahontas Times and showed Kathy the pictures of the two young women who had been killed. Now, at first, Kathy wasn't sure the girl in the photo was her sister. There definitely was a resemblance, but she couldn't be sure. So she drove back down to West Virginia to see if the girl in the photo really was her sister. I wonder if it's one of those things where she was pretty sure, but like, again, her brain didn't want to be like, no, that's definitely her. Yeah. So as she made her way back to West Virginia, investigators continued to struggle to make any kind of headway in this case. And like I said a minute ago, neither girl that was found had any identification. Yeah. And the only personal items found with them were a Swiss army knife and a pocket comb. And then the post-mortem exams were just as unhelpful. The cause of death was gunshots. This is horrible. Vicky had been shot twice in the chest. Oof. Nancy had also been shot twice in the chest, but also once in the head. Jeez. With what the technician believed was a high-powered rifle. Wow. Now, although they hadn't identified the bodies yet, local authorities felt confident that the killer was local, quote, because of the rural area in which the bodies were found. Oh. 
And they were also pretty certain that the girls had been killed in one location and then dumped where they'd been found because there was no blood pooling around the exit wounds. Okay. Now, Kathy reached Pocahontas County on July 8th and immediately went to the local police who took her to see the bodies. She later recalled, quote, My girlfriend knew right away, but I could not believe it was Nancy. Then I saw that she was wearing the silver bracelet I had given her. Like, that's an awful way. I can't imagine having to identify a family member, let alone like your sister. Yeah. So after identifying the bodies, Kathy was able to help the investigators get in touch with Vicky's family. And then she got in her car and drove back to New York to deliver the news to her mom in person. She said, I didn't want to have to tell her about Nancy on the telephone. Wow, that's, yeah. Can you imagine just having to, like, it's just you. And you're driving, knowing what you have to do. After just seeing what you saw, like that's your sister and her friend who you probably knew. And you're showing up at your mom's house. She's probably going to answer the door being like, oh, my God, hey, girl, you know, like like, so happy to see you. Like, la, 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 like mom stuff. Mm -hmm. And this is what you have to. And to think, too, that like you were at the gathering and you like you had no idea. Yeah. It's awful. Oh. So a couple of days after Nancy and Vicky were identified, the state police held a conference, a press conference, to announce the identification. Other information about the investigation was still really scarce. Investigators didn't believe that the motive was robbery. And actually, sometime later, Nancy's backpack was found about 50 miles from where the two bodies were discovered. Mm. And this is strange. Nothing appeared to be missing. But strangely, a Confederate flag was found among the possessions. Ooh. And like neither one of them would have had that, Vicky or That's Nancy. That's strange. And when Liz was asked about it, she said she didn't remember Vicky or Nancy being in possession of one. And she elaborated that it would have been very odd given who they were and what they believed Yeah, in. that seems to go against. So it seems like whoever did this to them left that there as like a fuck you. Wow. Mm-hmm. Now, as far as motives went, though... There was no evidence that either had been sexually assaulted, so that was ruled out as well. Mm. And in fact, aside from the murders, there had actually been no reports of violence in the area, so investigators had no suspects. What the fuck? Like, nothing. Now, the biggest and most unexpected information revealed during the press conference was that, in addition to the murders, Vicky and Nancy's friend Liz, who had been traveling with them, was still missing. Ah, because obviously yep. nobody knew that, like, only Vicky and Nancy knew what had happened, that but she, she had, gone, had gone off. So it took nearly a week before West Virginia authorities were actually able to track Liz down. She was in Vermont vacationing with her family oh. and had no idea how close she was to becoming the third victim of wow. this. Now, unfortunately, while Liz was able to fill in the timeline between when they left Iowa and got to Richmond, there really wasn't much else she could do or provide beyond hitchhiking from one destination to the other. Now, when reporters asked her whether she would continue hitchhiking, she said, right now, I don't think I'll do it again. It's kind of scary. I guess not all the good rides make up for the one bad one. Exactly. Which, like, what a haunting statement. I know. For the one one bad bad one. one. Like, oh, it gives me, like, chills. Because usually that's all you get is one bad one. Yep. Oh. So local authorities investigated the case for two years but they kept hitting dead end after dead end after dead end. They weren't able to turn up any leads, any additional evidence, nothing. Of course, they had some theories due to the remote location in which the bodies were found. I think I said this earlier. They definitely suspected that a local was responsible, but who and why completely eluded yeah. them. And then their investigation was further hindered by the fact that most local residents were pretty tight-lipped when it came to talking to law enforcement, Mm. and especially when the crime was committed against two quote-unquote outsiders. Yeah, they don't want to get involved. They're not going to concern themselves, which is really fucked up because it's like— These are two young girls. Two people. No (sighs) one in this town had, like, teenage sisters, teenage daughters, teenage cousins. Like, Jesus Christ. But the first break in the case finally came in July of 1982 when Vicky's family reported that they had received several anonymous calls from a man who seemed to know something about Vicky's murder. Whoever was calling refused to identify himself, but claimed the local police police, excuse me, quote, were not doing their job when it came to the investigation. And this caller said, as somebody who had a daughter himself, he was really sympathetic to the family suffering. Huh. But it was odd. Like, they were, yeah. they were turned off by these phone calls. So later that month, 
the police put a tap on Vicky's family's phone, and that led them to 36-year-old West Virginia tractor salesman and farmer and father, Jacob Beard. Hmm. Now, in 1982, Jacob Beard, he was actually already pretty well known to the police due to a a few charges of animal cruelty he was facing at the time. And he was facing those charges at the time that he was making the calls to Vicky's family. Trigger warning here. I'm just going to quickly tell you what those those, um, charges were about. So if you want to skip forward, I would do that Mm. now. According to the charges, he had killed his his former girlfriend's cat and left it in her bed for her to find. And he had also been accused of trying to kill her dog, but luckily the dog was able to be saved. Oh. He also did this on Christmas Eve. What? Mm Mm-hmm. Now, because the charges were still pending, the county prosecutor actually offered to dismiss those animal cruelty charges in exchange for Jacob Beard's cooperation in the case. Holy shit. And they also offered to grant him immunity for any after-the-fact involvement that he may have had in Vicky and Nancy's deaths. Damn. Crazy, I know. They were desperate desperate to get this solved. (laughs) Yeah. Now, but if it was found that he was directly responsible for the deaths, immunity would be off the table. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So according to Jacob Beard, he had left for work about 5.15 that night, the night that Vicky and um, Nancy were killed. Then he said he went home to eat something for dinner and then headed off to a school board meeting with his wife. He told authorities that he and his wife were returning from that meeting around 9 p.m. that night when they saw three local residents, Christine Cook, Palmer Adkinson, and William McCoy, entering into the woods near Droop Mountain Park with two women he said resembled Vicky and Nancy. Oh. Now, he also claimed that there was actually a third victim from the Rainbow family killed by Palmer Adkinson, and he knew that because Palmer... And another local resident, Arnold Cutlip, had brought the body back to his own property, Jacob's property, and disposed of the body by putting it into his corn chopper. What? So this is like a very fantastical tale if this is all true. Oof. Yeah. So the police arrested the men that Jacob claimed were responsible for the murders. But after two months of investigation, they determined his story was a hoax. What? And all three men were released from custody. So he just came up with this entire story and named random people involved? Supposedly. Wow. Maybe. It gets hairy. Oh, just wait. okay. So the shift in focus away from those suspects coincided with suspicions falling on two new suspects. 42-year-old Gerald Lee Brown and 20-year-old Bobby Lee Morrison. Now, according to Morrison, he had been out driving around with Gerald Lee uh, Brown, excuse me, on the night of June 24th, and he said they picked up Nancy and Vicky who were hitchhiking. And then he claimed the four of them spent some time drinking. He passed out in Gerald Brown's van, and when he woke up, Morrison claimed he witnessed Brown shoot both women, and then he said he helped Brown move the bodies out to Briary Knob before returning to town. Why are so many people admitting to having some kind of part in this? Oh, so many people? You're barely at the tip of the iceberg right now. What the fuck? It's why This case is one of the craziest ones when it comes to the investigation, I think, that I have wow. ever personally researched. Like, wow. It's wild. Now, both men were arrested in April 1983. Bail was set at $100,000 for Brown and $50,000 for Morrison. And in a press conference, prosecutor J. Stephen Hunter told reporters he, quote, in all probability would try to seek Morrison as an adult or excuse me, would seek to try Morrison as an adult, even though he was a juvenile at the time of the murders. So this is public now. Wow. Now, while the arrest of Morrison and Brown seemed like a pretty positive turn of events in the case, a lot of people in town were pretty confused or weary about how investigators actually became suspicious of those two in the first place. Prosecutor Hunter told reporters, quote, at the time, he, meaning Morrison, wasn't a suspect. It just happened that this turned out to be the lead that led to an arrest. But he would never say what the lead was that led them to Morrison and Brown. Yeah. Because there wasn't one. In all Mm. reality, Morrison himself went to the police out of nowhere to report himself and Brown as the men responsible for Vicky and Nancy's murders. What? So strange. Okay. 
But a few weeks later during the, I can never say this, preliminary hearing, Morrison recanted his initial confession (laughs) and told the judge and prosecutor that Jacob Beard had manipulated him into confessing in order to take the heat off of himself. So Jacob Beard is back? Back again. What the fuck? Morrison claimed that Beard told him, quote, something would happen to his family if he didn't make the statement. And that was the only reason he made up the story about picking up the hitchhikers in the first place. Wow. So under those circumstances, the prosecutor had to drop those charges against Morrison and Brown, and the case went cold again. Oh, yeah. This is a whirlwind, and this is barely even the beginning. Mm, Jeez. It didn't take long before investigators had a new suspect, though. On March 1st, 1984, while being interviewed by by a special agent from the Wisconsin Department of Justice for Unrelated Crimes, I feel like they should shorten their name. Maybe. Convicted serial killer Joseph Paul Franklin confessed to murdering two white female hitchhikers near Droop Mountain Forest. And he even provided a crudely drawn map of the location where he left the bodies. What? Now, I just want to give a trigger warning, probably, I would say, for racism here, because this guy is a racist piece of shit. So skip forward if you don't want to hear about him. I feel like his name is familiar. Yeah, you probably know yeah. about him. He's he's a yeah. monster. Yeah. So Joseph Paul Franklin had actually been born James Clayton Vaughn Jr., but changed his name to honor Benjamin Franklin and a Nazi leader named Paul Josef Goebbels, I think is how you say it. Uh, it sounds right to me. He's pretty terrible, so I don't actually care how to pronounce his name. Yeah. Uh, Franklin himself was a fucking deplorable monster. He was a member of the American Nazi Party, a member of the KKK, an avowed white supremacist, and a serial killer. Oh, he checks all the the really bad guy boxes. All the deplorable yeah. boxes. At the time of his confession, he was already serving multiple life sentences for murder. Uh, he mainly targeted black men and interracial couples. Wow. And he would eventually be convicted of killing eight people but suspected of killing more than 20. Wow. He confessed to over 20 murders, but they were never able to completely pin them down. Wow. So this would be out of his victim profile. It would be, but when Mm. you hear his quote unquote motive or what, at least what he says it is not necessarily. So according to his confession, he picked Vicky and Nancy up in West Virginia and the three had been just engaging in small talk And the subject of interracial dating came up. I'm sure he was the one to bring that up. Ah. And he was disgusted when neither woman objected to the idea of dating a black man. There it is. He said one of them said she had and the other said if the opportunity arose that she would. Yeah. Now, it was then he claimed that he decided to, quote, waste both of them right there. Jeez. He's a disgusting human. Oh, my gosh. In a prison interview, he said, it only took one shot for the first one. Then I just turned real quick over the seat and shot the other one. Okay. Later. That's awful. Horrible. And just like to think that it, one question and then that's it. But later he said he regretted killing Nancy because according to him, it was Vicky that was the one who had an interracial relationship before. And he said when he asked Nancy if she would consider it, she said she would. But he said he still wished he didn't kill her. What the fuck? He, it's he's. I don't even know if he did this. Like I don't really know what my opinion is because it get, it gets so convoluted along the way. Ugh. But I'm like, either way, like you're a fucking asshole. Yeah, you're disgusting. So Franklin's confession would seem to have brought the mystery to an end. But there were more than a few unanswered questions, and a lot of people suspected he wasn't telling the truth. Because after his initial confession, he refused to discuss the murders with law enforcement again. Hmm. And while he may have confessed to these murders, he actually seemed to have very few details about the crime. And some of them... stuff wrong. Right, exactly. For one thing, you you probably noticed, he said he only shot each girl one time before dragging their bodies out to the woods. When, like I said earlier, the technician who had performed the examinations, the postmortem examinations was clear that vicky had been shot twice and nancy had been shot three times yeah and then in addition to that it was believed that the um a high-powered rifle was the murder weapon that's what i didn't get a gun like that would be very awkward to use in the close yeah. confines of a car and it, it just, it just didn't make a lot up. of sense really. none of it lines up 
So finally, there was also the fact that he had a history a history of making supposedly false confessions. Oh, there you go. So they were like, mm, I don't what? know about this. I, you, ugh, I do, I'm like, you monstrous. Like truly. Monstrous. To try to take credit for this kind of stuff. It's like, my goodness. And by the time he was executed by lethal injection in 2013, Ooh. like not that long ago, he had confessed to more than 20 murders across the country. Wow. Including the shooting of Hustler Magazine founder Larry Flint in 1978 Whoa. and Urban League president Vernon Johnson in 1980. Oh, so he was just like taking credit for everything. Mm -hmm. They were never able, I guess, to prove that he like didn't uh, do either of those shootings. Yeah. But... But they weren't able to prove he did either. Correct. Exactly. <laughs> Correct. Correct. I always sound very condescending when I say that. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Now, given the questionable validity of his claims, authorities in West Virginia declined to prosecute, saying that the confession, quote, lacked the requisite guarantees of trustworthiness. Yeah, it doesn't line up for me. No. Now, in the context of West Virginia law, the confession fell into the category, I thought this was interesting, of what's known as a statement against interest or a statement that is so contrary to the declarant's interests that it's unlikely to be true. Huh. Yeah. Now, because they're mostly determined to be false, a statement against interest is typically not admissible in court. Oh, okay. And without any more corroborating yeah. evidence, West Virginia prosecutors were like, yeah, he's not a viable this suspect. This would be a supreme waste of time. That's basically how they felt. Now, I don't know. I'm not sure what I think about it. Because when you think about the fact that a Confederate flag was left with their belongings. Oh, yeah. But I mean, he's not the only. And that's what I was just yeah. going to say. Like, he, that seems like something he probably would have done. But again, he's not the only person that would do yeah. that. Yeah, you know? I don't, to me, I don't, just from hearing that, I would say no. But yeah, the fact that he didn't know how many times each was shot. Yeah. And, I and guess, that it was a high-powered rifle, that would be very difficult to do in a car. In a car, right. And um, the map he drew was not, it was like all right, but they were like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, you could have got that no. from reading different yeah. sources about this case. Nope. Don't buy it. Yeah. Well, you're not the only one. And law enforcement officials were not the only ones who considered this confession self-serving, wildly yeah. inconsistent with the details, all of the above. A lot of people, including actually Nancy's own family, found these claims yeah. hard to believe. And like many investigators, Nancy's sister Kathy believes Franklin had picked up a few details yeah. from magazines or news reports, mm. which would account for the lack of specif specificity in his claims. Because he gave no details None. that would be something only the killer would know. Exactly. And if you can't give me that, then you weren't there. Exactly. That's the thing. If you can read it in a magazine or a newspaper... I don't I don't trust it. That's the thing. And actually, at the time he was arrested, he supposedly I couldn't like totally pin this down. But I read in a couple sources that he was said to have a magazine in his possession that laid out a couple of the key details yeah. from the case. Yeah. And those were the ones he pointed to. There you go. So authorities in West Virginia, they shared Kathy's theory. An anonymous source from the prosecutor's office told reporters, his story has evolved over the years. When he, when he began this scenario, he really knew none of the details. He did not know how many times the women had been shot. He did not know what areas of, areas of the body the wounds were sustained. And he could not accurately describe his route before and after the murders. Yeah. Bye. So, bullshit. Yeah. Now, after the quick collapse of his confession, the investigation into Vicky and Nancy's murders went inactive Jeez. yet again. Getting, you know, the occasional review every so often, but other than that, remaining mostly cold. And it wasn't until late 1991 wow. when a new group of investigators decided to give the case a second look. Now, in that review, this is so interesting. Detectives, or at least to me, detectives found a note from 1985 regarding a local woman named Alice Roberts who had contacted them and they had never followed up with her initial like reaching out to them. What? So when detectives got in touch with Alice, these new detectives, she redirected them to her daughter, Pam Wilson, saying that she actually knew her daughter thought, or she believed that her daughter knew something about the murders. Oh, wow. So and they just ignored her the first time around. Just wow. never got back to her. Cool. So, right. So according to Pam Wilson, she had been in town on the day that the murders occurred. And she said she saw two quote unquote hippie type women get into a blue van belonging to a man named Richie Fowler. And she said, Richie Fowler wasn't alone that afternoon. He was in the company of two other local men, Winters Pee Wee Walton and William McCoy. 
William McCoy had previously been arrested. I was just going to say, that rings a bell. Yeah. Um, And that he was arrested alongside Jacob Beard. So the tip was definitely of interest. Yeah. So around the same time, investigators were also contacted by an inmate named Keith Culliner, I believe is how you say his last name. He was serving a 10-year prison sentence for forgery, and he said that he was willing to trade information about the murders in exchange for better prison conditions. I'm just going to pause there. Better prison conditions. <laughs> just saying. I'm like, if you got something again, I don't know yeah, if I, I don't you. know. But he claimed that he had actually been at Gerald, Brown, Gerald Brown's home several months after the murders, and while he was there, he overheard Gerald Brown confess that he, Richie Fowler, and two other men had been responsible for the murders and that, quote, everyone should just keep their mouth shut. Whoa. So that's pretty interesting. Jeez, this is like set of people number four. The amount, it got so yeah. confusing at the end because there's going to be even more players and a bunch of them have the same last name or like one has a last name that's somebody wow. else's first name. I was getting really confused. But... After investigating Pam's tips as well as Keith's, investigators learned of more eyewitness accounts who had spotted a group of men, including Pee Wee Walton, William McCoy, and Richie Fowler, together on the day of the murder. Oh. Now, one tipper claimed they actually saw three of the men hosing out the back of the van on oh. the same night. Mm-hmm. That's chilling. Now, based on the... And remember, they had said they didn't believe that they had been killed there. They believed that they had been they killed been, elsewhere yeah, and dumped, and dumped there. there. So that's interesting that they maybe were hosing the van out, allegedly. Now, based on the tips, arrest warrants were actually itch- issued for a man named Richard Lewis, who also eventually was brought into the equation, Gerald Brown, Pee Wee Walton, and Arnold Cutlip. All of them denied any involvement, but still, obviously, they were not like, yeah, your word's the best ever. Yeah, they're like, oh, sounds good. Oh, okay, never mind. You're free to go. So they were held on a $100,000 bond, all of them. Now, in his statement to the press, Prosecutor Walt Wayford refused to speculate on any kind of motive. But he said, the arrest to date are the result of an intensive investigation conducted by Sheriff Jerry Dale and Sergeant Robert A. Alkire. They worked a lot of long and hard hours. Now... Sheriff Dale was also pretty vague about what led investigators to these four men who had been arrested. And all he really said to the public was, people got older and became less intimidated and frightened about the subjects who were responsible for the murders. Okay. Which, like, sure, okay. He declined to add any additional details. But to me, it sounds like they probably... Should have listened. Should have listened to the original tip from six years ago. Yeah. You know, but like, okay. Maybe just call her back. Just call her back. Just call her back. She reached out for a reason. And it looks like she had some valuable information. You've just arrested how many people? So within a few days, actually additional charges were brought against three other men believed to have been involved in the crime. Johnny Lewis, Jacob Beard, yet again, and William McCoy. Now, all three of them had been suspected of some involvement at some point, as we all know at this point, in the previous decade. How many men were involved in this? Jeez. I think seven total. Wow. One resident told reporters, a couple of those are very surprising. And then there's a couple of people that's not so surprising. Oof. Now, within a few weeks of the arrest, people in town were talking, and they had their own theories about the motive of the killers. Most people agreed that it was anger surrounding this supposed hippie invasion of the Rainbow family. But the prosecutor's office had yet to make any formal statement as to what they believed was the motive. Gerald Brown's defense attorney, Paul Detch, was suspicious, though, when it came to the evidence that led to the arrests. And he told reporters, it's a bunch of police officers who are on a witch hunt. They've got people held on paperwork that wouldn't hold an assault and battery case. Whoa. So it was it was shaky grounds here that they were holding them on. And Arnold Cutlip's lawyer, Martin Safer, agreed, saying they're going to have to flesh out the allegations of the warrant if they can. Eek. So he was like, I don't know. Now, Dutch, Safer, and many others in town actually suspected that the prosecutor's office didn't really have any new information about the case, but they just wanted to clear the notorious cold case to make it seem like they were getting shit done. I mean, and that does happen. Of course it does. And the county prosecutor on the case, Walt Wayford, wasn't doing much to stifle those suspicions. He wasn't talking a lot. Yeah. He, which you can look at two ways. One, he's yeah, not course. talking because he barely has anything. Yeah. Or he has a shit ton and he's keeping it close to the chest. Exactly. We've said that how many times. 
All he would say to the public was that the evidence would be presented at the grand jury hearing. But other than that, nothing. Okay. So by the time the case did reach the grand jury, things did not appear to be going smoothly for the prosecutor's office. The charges against Pee Wee Walton had been dropped for lack of evidence. William McCoy was already serving a sentence in Nevada for an unrelated crime. Jacob Beard was living in Florida at this point and fighting extradition. And the two others who were involved were invoking their Fifth Amendment rights and refusing to cooperate. Cool. In fact, by May 1992, only two cases, Arnold Cutlip and Gerald Browns, were bound for trial. Wow. Two months later, the cases against the seven men charged with these two murders had pretty much fallen apart. Wow. And the prosecutor, Walt Wayford, had no choice but to drop the charges. What? He told reporters, I'm sitting here with a case that's been torpedoed. Now, what he was referring to was some new information that had come to light about investigation procedures. Uh Uh-oh. According to the prosecutor's office, Trooper Michael Jordan of the state's Bureau of Criminal Investigations had used improper investigation procedures and, quote-unquote, seriously compromised the case. Oh, no. Wayford said he still planned to present the case to a grand jury in August of 1992, but he wasn't hopeful that it would go anywhere. Oh, man. Now... He was right to be discouraged. By the time the grand jury did review the evidence and considered the accusations of uh, police misconduct, all the charges were dropped. Oh, man. And in the weeks that followed, they kept on trying. New indictments were issued against Jacob Beard, Richard Fowler, William McCoy, and Arnold Cutlip. But of all of those new indictments, only Jacob Beard would end up going to trial. I mean, he's been a consistent name in all of this for sure. He has. Now, his trial started in late May of 1993, and he was facing first-degree murder charges for, obviously, the murders of Vicky and Nancy. From the moment the trial began, the prosecution's case seemed pretty flimsy. They relied on hearsay testimony from some of the men that had previously been charged alongside Jacob Beard. Oh, boy. And they alleged, the prosecution, that after picking up Vicky and Nancy, Jacob Beard attempted to convince one or both of them to have sex with him. And when they turned down his advances, he shot them both and dumped their bodies in the woods. Okay. That was their theory. Their quote-unquote evidence against him included, one, statements from that previous inmate that we talked about, Keith, um, and Pam Wilson, which placed him at Gerald Brown's house on the night that the men were heard confessing. Okay. Two, a statement from a man who claimed he saw Beard, quote, driving at a high rate of speed away from Droop Mountain, which was where the bodies were found, on the night of the murders. And three, statements from Johnny Lewis and Pee Wee Walton that implicated Jacob Beard as the killer. It should be noted that these two men had actually been beaten by investigators previously, and that's why they had confessed previously. Oh. That's what I meant earlier by improper investigative oh. procedures. Yeah, that would be improper. Mm-hmm. And actually, one investigator previously stated that Johnny Lewis, quote, could be talked into saying anything. Wow. Lewis only, this is like sad that they went after him if he had nothing to do with this. He only had an education up to the third grade, and he didn't even know who the president was at the time he was being interrogated. Oh, man, that gives me Jesse Muskelly vibes. That is immediately what I thought of, and I knew you would, too. And the same investigator— If he didn't have something to do with this, of of course. course. The same investigator—I don't don't know if I think he did. The same investigator said Lewis only gave the confession because he was scared, and he had previously been hit. He actually—I think the direct quote was that he was so scared he felt like he was going to pee, Oh, which is, like, heartbreaking, again, if he had nothing to do with this. Yeah. But both of those men had been beaten previously into confessing. So, yeah, I don't really know how we're going to believe their testimony. Not great. Now, Jacob Beard's defense attorney, Stephen Framer, of course, claimed his client's innocence. But he and he noted that the cases there, excuse me, the state's case relied almost entirely on testimony from known liars and accusations from two men who had only recently been given immunity in exchange for their testimony against Jacob Beard. Again, Not great. Not great. The defense also made several motions to introduce evidence that maybe wouldn't necessarily prove innocence, but at the very least would have cast doubt on these charges against Jacob Beard. And that evidence included uh, Yosef, I guess, Paul Franklin's confessions from years earlier. But the trial judge refused to admit any of the defense's evidence, calling it hearsay and unreliable. Oof. But it's like, I 
think it's hearsay that all these other people who were previously accused and unreliable that we would believe them too. This is a mess. Like, I'm not saying that Jacob Beard didn't have anything to do with it because I don't know one way or the other. But I mean, this is who we have testifying against him. Yeah. I mean, this is just, what what's really sad about this whole thing is that Vicky and Nancy are just at the center of this chaos but got like completely lost in this that's the thing they're just trial. like we don't even know anything about what happened to them and it sounds night. like the it in my opinion it sounds like the investigators didn't even really care to find out what happened to them they just wanted to close the case that's the thing it, that's what it kind of feels like it, it became less about let's get justice for these two young girls who were just going to a music festival yeah like some little get together like festival like a rainbow gathering right instead of really focusing on that part of it they're really just focusing on clearing their books yeah and it's like and, and they're doing not it quickly and they're not even doing it properly like no you're that's beating the thing. people to confess you really feel good about that it really it like west memphis three vibes because in that case it's the same thing they yeah. grabbed the three kids who they could pin this on yep because they needed to clear this off the books mm -hmm. and it's like that never works man like nobody wants you to just bullshit everybody into into thinking it's been solved right because eventually we're gonna find out people that are gonna find out no it wasn't and they're gonna find out that one you didn't care about the actual victims and two that you put everybody in danger exactly. by letting the real people get away with it exactly it's but, it's really honestly this is like a tragedy yeah. in so many different i mean ways. i can tell you right now i have no fucking clue who is innocent here and who isn't Same. i have no idea i have no opinion on it because i it's all lost. By the end of this, I had read Truly. so many different things to try to <laughs> convince myself whoever did it. Yeah. Or whoever had done it did, but I, I'm still at a loss. I yeah. have no idea. So far, I am I have no opinion. I just think it's a mess. To be quite honest with you, by the end, I don't think you'll be convinced. Probably not. Either way. So in his closing statement, Stephen Framer reminded the jury of the unlikely scenario presented by the prosecutor. And he told them, if the state is right, Jacob Beard would have had to kill two girls in front of a group of people he mostly did not know. That's true. It's pretty weird. Framer also reminded the jury that his client actually had an alibi that contradicted the statements made by the men formerly accused alongside him. And this included evidence showing that Jacob was almost certainly at work the night, oh. uh, like that night and around the time that the murders were committed. However, That's interesting. I did read that his time card was handwritten. Okay. So that could easily be changed. All right. Yeah. And I, I just will say that. Now, in his, clo in his closing arguments, Prosecutor Walt Wayford told the jury, quote, the only person who has testified here who can tell you where Jake Beard was between the hours of 3.15 and 8 p.m. that day is Jake Beard, mm. implying that the accused can't be trusted, which yeah. is fair, even though most of his key witnesses had actually been the accused at one point or the other. Legitimately, no one can be trusted here. None. Now, on June 4th, 1993, the jury deliberated for six hours before returning with a guilty verdict on both wow. counts of first degree murder and Jacob Beard was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole otherwise known as life without mercy damn yeah now we're not done because what should have been a moment of relief or you know possibly I know you can't necessarily get closure but some no. kind of closure for Nancy and Vicky's friends and family was instead completely suspicious and most people were still skeptical about all the details involved Nancy's own mother, Jean, spoke to reporters about the conviction later, saying, you should have heard the testimony. I didn't think there was enough evidence, and I wasn't convinced he was the one. Wow. So, and like, that tells you something. One of the victim's own mothers is like, I, this evidence was wild, and the testimony was insane, and I don't think he did it. Because he, or as, I wasn't convinced he did it. As a loved one of somebody who this happened to, like, you would want... To be convinced yeah, that absolutely. they have the guy who did it to your child or your loved one. Like, you don't want to just go, okay, I, I guess. Like, you want right. to walk out of there being like, yes, they convinced me. That is him. Right, because that's the thing. Like, Essentially, if you're not convinced, then the question on your mind is like, well, is this another life lost in yeah, this like, case? Like, is, is this it? An, or like, are there more that we don't know about? Like, yeah, you know, there's just a lot here. I feel really bad for them family members here because they too. did not get that moment of at least for a minute justice being served and unfortunately i don't think they ever did i <sighs> think that this family was left with more questions than they probably had even in the beginning of wow 
the tragedy that happened and to again them. i have no idea if this man did it or not i don't either. i really don't feel confident saying either way so. nor do i so in January of 1995, this is where things get a little bit complicated. There's a lot of legal jargon here, but I okay. did my best to kind of, I looked into it myself and I was like, I am not quite sure what that means. So then I kept <laughs> looking into it and I broke it down in an ash way for Okay, you. cool. So in January 1995, Jacob Beard appealed his conviction to the Supreme Court of Appeals of West Virginia. Among other things, the appeal cited the refusal to admit key pieces of the defense's case, like Franklin's confession the result of Beard's polygraph test, the fact that he had actually been granted immunity from prosecution in 1983. Oh, yeah. And the fact that 11 years had passed between his arrest and his conviction. Wow. Now, the appeals also cited numerous errors supposedly committed during the trial. Those uh, errors were allegations of police misconduct to what was considered credible evidence, everything okay. in between. Now, regarding the claim of immunity... Beard's attorney acknowledged that the 1983 deal didn't necessarily protect him if he was the principal yeah, actor. that's true. However, his role in the crime was supposed to be determined in what's known as a castigar hearing. Well, and that never occurred. Now, a castigar hearing is based, is excuse me, a hearing based on a 1972 Supreme Court case. And essentially it states that a witness who is compelled to testify after they've been given immunity, but then is later prosecuted has a right to this hearing where the state has, quote, the heavy burden of proving that all evidence it, propo it proposes to use was derived from legitimate independent sources. Okay. Now, that makes sense. Right? I thought so. In their decision, the justices wrote, the state argues that the failure to grant a Castigar hearing is harmless where it is otherwise evident that any immunized evidence admitted at trial did not prejudice the accused. And okay. that's where things get hairier, because in order to invoke this harmless error rule, there would have had to have been a Castigar hearing. So it all goes back to the Castigar hearing. Right. Yeah. So after reviewing the evidence and the trial transcripts, the justices upheld the lower court's conviction, but they did remand the case for a review in the lo lower courts, quote, to determine whether any prosecution evidence had been developed from leads Beard provided after being granted limited immunity. Okay. Because if he provided those leads that, like, led to him, it would fuck things up from my understanding. Uh, yeah. It wouldn't necessarily be derived purely that makes sense. Right? Yeah. It's very convoluted, but you made it easier to understand. Okay, I hope so. Thank so, you for that. You're welcome. <laughs> so Jacob Beard finally did get his Castigar hearing, which was held in early September 1996 in the Circuit Court of Greenbrier County. The judge in that case ruled that the evidence was properly obtained. Okay. He wrote that, quote, the state had not violated, excuse me, violated the use of immunity agreement and entered to with Beard. Okay. But... Undeterred, Jacob Beard and his attorney appealed the lower court's decision again in 1998, but again, the Supreme Court of Appeals upheld the lower court's conviction. Okay. Now, with no additional errors to claim in the trial, Beard's lawyer, lawyer filed a petition for a writ of habeas corpus. Mm -hmm. Now, that is the fundamental instrument for safeguarding individual freedom against arbitrary and lawless state action. Okay. So the argument there was that certain evidence, mainly the sworn deposition from Yosef Paul Franklin's confessions, was barred at, at J, uh, Jake Beard's original trial. Mm -hmm. Now, the petition also included the earlier testimony from Arnold Cutlip, which had also been barred from evidence at trial, in which he admitted he had actually been with Richard Lewis on the day of the murders. And contrary to what he said at trial, the two men actually had not seen Beard oh. that day. That previously wasn't allowed in court. So in layman's terms, Beard's defense attorney, Stephen Framer, was arguing that this was crucial evidence that should never have been withheld from the jury and that with his at this evidence, his client could likely be proven innocent. Yeah, so that makes sense. Basically ba saying I have evidence here and it wasn't allowed and that's why we should retry this. Yeah. Cool. So in a statement to the press, Stephen Framer indicated his intent to request a retrial, saying Franklin certainly has the resume to have done what he's uh, done what he says he's done. So talking about 
that original confession. Uh, the serial killer. The serial killer's confession that we weren't so sure about. Yeah, I don't know about that one. But again, that all I have to go on is very little information. So, right. And it's valid to bring up in, in that trial. Of course I it would is. say. Because it's a valid argument to be like, well, multiple people have confessed to this. So yeah, look at absolutely. these people also doing the same. Yeah. And he also talked about the seriously questionable sources that the prosecutors used as evidence for their conviction, yeah. specifically Pee Wee Walton, who, like I said earlier, only accused Jacob Beard after he had been wildly intimidated, Yeah, which is a new legal term that I made. Look it up. Freemer told the press, quote, he didn't remember anything about this until he was beaten by state police. Oof. Talking about Arnold Cutlip. Now, in January of 1999, the writ of habeas corpus was granted, and Beard's conviction was vacated with orders for yet another new trial. Wow. Now, Jacob Beard's new trial began in May 2000, this time in Braxton County, because there had been so much press coverage and public awareness in Pocahontas County yeah. that he was never going to get a fair trial there. Mm, yeah. Now, in this trial, he actually testified on his own behalf, admitting he couldn't remember his actions the night of June 25th, 1980, but he maintained that he had never met and definitely did not kill Vicky and Nancy. Yeah, which I think is a fair thing to say. Who the hell would remember what they were doing on June 25th, 1980? But you can definitely remember if you killed someone. 100%. Yeah. Fair statement to me. Yeah. Now, also testifying now in his defense, remember, a man previously testified against him, was Arnold Cutlip. Oh, shit. He told the jury he had lied in his oh. earlier testimony and that he, had, in fact, had not seen Beard on the day of the murders. Instead, oh. Stephen Framer told the jury it was uh, Paul Yosef Franklin who had committed the murders. And this time, his confession was entered into evidence. Okay. Now, Nancy's mother, Jean, actually also wrote a letter for the defense stating she believed Jacob Beard was innocent. Wow. Yeah. Now, when it came time for the prosecution's case, the most damning evidence they still had were the two calls that Jacob Beard had placed to the Durian home, Vicky's family home, yep. two years after the murders. I actually forgot that that was him. I don't blame you. Glad you brought that back around. been a lot of characters. Yes. Yeah. Now... That had actually gone a long way in his original trial to convince the jury that he was guilty. Yeah. But he didn't He didn't say any. It's weird that he called them, in my opinion. But wasn't he just saying, I have a daughter? Yeah. And it bothers me that you are not getting the information that you should be getting? Yeah, he was sympathizing them. Which, again, I understand why the family members were like, this is strange and freaking me out. Definitely. But it sounds like if you look at it just purely from what it is, it's like, okay, it doesn't look like he, if he's innocent, then it looks like he just didn't have any malicious intent and literally was just trying to share sympathize. information or sympathize. That's the thing because I can't tell. <laughs> I, I think I would feel differently <laughs> if he had been like calling them and heavy breathing on the other line yeah, like, or hanging like, up like a creep. And, exactly, like harassing them. I mean, like, he he did refuse to identify himself, which was strange. But maybe it was like him just being freaked out because he was under those animal cruelty charges. Charges exactly. at the time, which, so... Not great. Which, also, that's not a good thing. He maintains he had he didn't do anything to do with that, and those charges were dropped, so okay. we don't so necessarily know one way or the other. I was going to say, if he maintains he didn't do it and the charges were dropped, then we'll negate that. And the charges were dropped, again, because of these new charges yeah. where he was granted immunity. It's but we, all very complicated. But it makes sense not to even go there at this right. point, because let's just look at the information we have. And then you think... He was criticizing the police mm. in this case. Yeah, he sure was. And that's just a statement. That's that's just, that's just a statement that he was. And yeah. And I mean, I'm just, the fact that Nancy's mother, Jean, wrote a letter right. for the defense stating she believed he's innocent, that compels me to stand more on her side. Right. Not only that, but even when he had been previously... Uh, convicted of this crime she spoke to the press and was like yeah i, I wasn't convinced he, yeah and the evidence and testimony at that trial was insane and now she i mean if she's willing to have this guy out that tells you a lot she in my really opinion. doesn't believe that he did it no like there's no way you're gonna want the somebody who killed your daughter in such walking a callous and streets. awful way just walking around yeah if you don't truly believe in your heart that he didn't do it mm -hmm, exactly so this is very interesting i will say that nancy's sister kathy wasn't so sure she oh, okay. didn't 
it doesn't seem like she thought Jacob did it, but I don't think she thought that he didn't do she it. She wasn't convinced either She way. was like us. Yeah, I was, was going like, to say. I have no idea what happened yeah. here, and it's oh, a tragedy either way. This is awful for this, these families. It's horrible. Because it really I'm is. frustrated right now. I can't even begin to fathom how they feel. Exactly. Now, again, just going back to the prosecution's main case here again was those two phone calls that he made to the Durian family. In his defense, Beard said he read an article in 1982 about how the murders remained unsolved, and as a father himself, he was sympathetic. Mm -hmm. He told the jury, I was sorry the police hadn't followed up the way many people in the area thought they should. Okay. You know? When you hear that, you're like, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. I don't know if you necessarily need to, like, call a grieving no, family. No, I do not agree with your methods here, sir, but... But okay, if you're if you're saying it's pure... I'm hoping the thought was pure behind it. Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. Now, the jury deliberated for less than three hours this time and came back and acquitted wow. Jacob Beard on all charges on May 31st. A year later, Jacob Beard filed a wrongful conviction lawsuit against the Pocahontas County Police Department. And in January 2003, the county agreed to settle the case, awarding him $2 million. Wow. Yeah. I will say I saw $2 million in some sources and $1.3 million. And other sources. Still a lot of money. Uh, either way, he got millions. He got a lot of money. Yes. He, I think he said he bought a new tractor, but he wasn't about to buy like a bunch of other shit. Okay. Because that's what he said. All right. Now. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I just don't know. I don't How really. to feel about any of this. So ne neither do I. I'm just going to say, okay. I know that Kathy, Nancy's sister, didn't love that he was awarded that okay. money. Because she, again, she still wasn't convinced that. He was innocent or that he was guilty. Okay. And in her mind, if he was guilty, he just got awarded millions of dollars. Absolutely. That's why I'm going to stay over here and just... And then I think Gene was just like, good for him. Like, I, I can't Yeah, like anymore. whatever. Yeah. Which is awful. Ugh. So the Rainbow family continues to hold annual gatherings around the United States. Wow. Actually, incidents of violent crime remain low at the gatherings, but murders continue to occasionally take place at the events with the last murder as recent as 2021. Oh. I'm going to look into some of those yeah. and potentially update if it's got enough for a full case. Wow. But interesting. <clears throat> Very interesting. And sadly, as of today, the murders of Vicky Durian and Nancy Santamero remain unsolved. That's awful. That's honestly the biggest thing and in this case is I can't believe... That just, they got lost in it. And I, I blame the investigators in this case. You can't yeah. intimidate people into confessing because it muddies the waters. Yes, you've lost all your credibility. At that any point. Any trust, any kind of anything, professionalism, whatever you have going in, you, it's taken all out. And you fucked up the case. And it's like, if you have, if you do your job, then you, and you are good at your job, mm -hmm. then you will convince somebody to give you information or you will have evidence to keep them. Exactly. Like, you don't need to beat it out of them. I really hope that, like, someday there's some form of, you know, DNA that gets found. Or I mean, oh, I, I think really they would have found it at this point, You, I guess you would assume. But yeah. I just hope somebody talks. I want someone to talk, somebody to that has make actual, a real confession. Yeah. Uh, like, like you just said, actual meat to right, it. Exactly. Like, somebody can sit there and go, this is what I saw, this is who I saw there, and you, they can put the pieces together. But now there's so much information out about it's so muddled. the case. Exactly. It's so muddled. I, but I just feel bad for their families, like, their, their brothers and sisters just not having any idea yeah. what happened. And, like, their parents. And to be, like, conflicted on whether this guy is really innocent or not or guilty or not, it's like, that's really hard. It is. You, know? you don't know. And for him, it's like if he's guilty mm. walking around with that much money, it's like, Jesus fucking Christ, dude. Yeah, but if he's innocent. But if he's innocent, then, then like, he, and he, he got needed to be like that. Yeah, then he lost, like, you know, years of his life. And, Everything, you know, really. You know? Yeah, it's, it's really tragic all around. It is. And to think that, again, if he's innocent, to think that he spent that much time in prison. Mm -hmm. like, holy shit. Yeah. So that wow. is un a very unfortunate case. That's a sad one. It is. I mean, they're all sad, but that one's just like, you don't get that sense of like, at least we know who did it. Yeah, no justice and just yeah. a very layered case, very. like layered with tragedy. Yeah. Oof. But we hope you keep listening. And we hope you keep it weird. weird. Not so weird that, not so weird. Not that weird. So don't keep it that weird. <laughs> <laughs>